inspiration, eh? Should have wore a stupid collar. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Oh, sorry. Just hang by. Who experiences the, the presence of joy in God? Everyone? It's absolutely amazing. What can compare to it? It, it never ceases to amaze me. It settles my heart. So I've been seeking the Lord for a word for this morning. There it is. What is it? <laughs> So bear with me because I've been asking him for you guys. So I've got a lot of stuff that he's given me. I don't know if you ever, you've ever studied and wrote things down. And then you pick it up again and go, what does all that mean? He gives it to you and then it sort of seems to disappear on you. And that's what it's like. Sometimes. I don't pretend to be a, a road scholar. I don't pretend to be anything other than I'm God's man. And he chose me and set me apart. This morning, I got some dirty rags and I put them on the cross. I'm just going to say they're mine. They're my dirty rags. That's who I was before I got saved. I don't know the Zoomers can see that. But they're my dirty rags. That's who I was. I was lost and I was separated from God. And all that is my sin. I was steeped in it. It oozed out of my pores. That's where I came from and that's where you came from. From the moment Adam sinned at the, at, the, at the beginning and broke off all that fellowship with the Lord himself, we become as filthy rags. But that exchange, no matter how many times I think about it, and we must think about it because this is where we live our life, here at the cross, we can't live away from there because then you'll soon forget what's happened. It's such a great mystery, the exchange of my filthiness for his righteousness. Now, I had an idea of putting on white pants and a white T-shirt, but that would be a bit silly. Um, most of them don't fit me anyway. <clears throat> I've been living in too much abundance. But the mystery of Jesus the mystery of what he's done for us. <sighs> he never fails to bring me undone. When I think about that exchange, that he would give his life for me. And I think, I think a, little, a lot about, about you guys, about this place, about this body, about the church at large, not just here, but across the world when God says that in these last days he's going to pour out his spirit upon us. And, the, and if, we, if he doesn't, the rocks are going to cry out for Jesus. The rocks are going to cry out. And the whole earth is travailing, waiting for you and I. I'm not going to say the sons and daughters, it's sort of abstract. I've got to say you and I, because that's what the whole earth is waiting for. It's travailing under the weight of the sin of this world that's crushing the people, it's crushing their mindsets, it's crushing their lives, it's changing the whole fabric of society into something that's so twisted and so evil. Everything has been calling, everything that's evil has been called good now. 
It's bizarre. It, it's my, I, every day I'm, I boggle over this and thinking, how could they possibly call something that's evil? How can they call it good? How can they euthanize someone and call it good? What right has one man got to kill another man? We don't. Isn't that murder? So how can we legalise that? The mind boggles to think that we are passing laws in this country, in this nation and across the world that facilitates this, that facilitates the death of children, little babies. I don't know about you, I came from brokenness. My mum and dad loved us. There's no question. I never questioned that. They did. I saw it. My dad showed it to me. My mum showed it to me. But nevertheless, we were from a broken home. My mum was a lost generation girl from Aboriginal, taken away for nearly two years from her mum and dad. She had three younger siblings under her. And it's affected her deeply. But, you know, through all that pain, through all that brokenness, the essence of who she is shines out of her. She is the most beautiful mum that I could ever have asked for. There's something very special about her. That thing that I know that shines out of her is the essence of God that's in her spirit. She may not know that. Before she was even born, God knew her and placed in her his essence, his love. And every now and then, I used to see it shine through so brightly when I was a kid growing up, in awful circumstances where she, where her own family had stolen from her. We had, we had nothing. We were pretty poor. Dad sent us out, taught us how to trap rabbits, so most people here probably did the same thing. You had to supplement what you ate because you lived off the land. That's normal back a few thousand years ago, but it's not normal today. Because we're supposed to work and do the you know the worldly thing and buy food, supply to your family. It was a marvelous upbringing, being taught those skills to do those sort of things. But mum, you know, it was a lot of hardship too because of lack of money, and it worried dad. I mean, he had well, seven mouths to feed, and uh, you know he wasn't he didn't see himself as a super duper intelligent man, so he was a labourer. He said he was a very smart man. He could build anything, make anything, fix anything. Now, that's skill. That's the workmanship of God. That's a gift in him, just as much as a gift of a man that knows how to heal people, a doctor. You know, we, we put a level on things. We grade people. It's never more evident than it is in India, you know, the caste system they have over there, the super rich and the super poor. It's a disgusting thing that man doesn't care for his fellow man. So I know, though I've come from brokenness, so have you in lots of ways. Your life has led you to this point. You've come through many trials. But, I, you know, I, I, I can't live away from him, from this beautiful man of what he's done. It grips me all the time. I, I, uh, I get down on myself because I don't live fully the way I should do for him. Because I know I don't belong to myself. I know that without a shadow of a doubt that I don't belong to myself. And we should know that. Every one of us should know that. That you're not your own. That we're not here to live for yourself. We're here to live for those out there. We're here to love one another as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. There is no greater sacrifice than that, that a man should lay down his life for his fellow man or his brother, sister, whoever that might be. I, I, um, God gave me a word and I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> How many some I should know, shouldn't I? I woke up a couple of mornings ago and clear as a bell, these words came to me, and the power of God was present to heal them all. I'm going, where's that? Where's that? And it's in Luke 5, 17.
And the power of God was present to heal them all. I'm standing out here and I'm worshipping God and the power of his presence comes. The weight of his presence comes. The weight of his glory comes. And I can't speak when it, when it comes down. It's so heavy that it shuts me up. Because I don't believe in the glory of God. You want to say anything. You just want to be in him. Because we've all been made for his glory. But we're in this earthly tent that hasn't been made for the glory. That's why we need a new one when we go to be with him. And so in the meantime, this earthly tent is subjected to things unseen. We get diseases and we get ill health. We, get, we lose our peace. We get tormented. And yet in our lives... God is saying the power of God is present to heal you of all those things. The power of God is present to heal you. So we've got a very brave young lady here today in Catherine. She's very, very brave. She's a saint. She's our sister. We're all saints. We're all saints. But I believe the word, Catherine. I believe the word that the power of God is present to heal his people. So we just release that power into her now. Thank you, Lord, for the power to heal our sister right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. You've paid the price for her. Your blood has cleansed her, and your body that was broken has healed her. And we thank you for that great exchange this morning. Strengthen her, Lord. Strengthen her as she walks this trial. But she keeps walking until she walks through to the cross and out again. We thank you, Father, for your blessing over her today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I just had a vision of Catherine dancing and singing before the cross. Amen. 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 We believe it. I believe it with all my heart. I was subjected to cancer. I had problems with my spine that was going to put me in a wheelchair. But once God spoke to me and told me that he's going to heal me, I never wavered. Because his word is infallible. I'd been on morphine for a year. My body was racked with pain because my spinal column was being strangled. And yet once he had spoken to me, a peace beyond my understanding came. Because my heart says, he's my healer. My heart says, he's my dad. He's my brother, Jesus. He has the power to do all things. And so I stood on that word from that moment on, even sitting in the office of the neurosurgeon as she told me how she was going to operate on me and cut me to pieces to try her best. And she truly was trying her best to help me. But I don't want man's help. I'm at that place in my heart where I don't want man's help. I want my supply, I want my everything to come from him because he is my life. He's the one that created me. He's my dad, my father in heaven. How grateful I was the day that he called me. My dad called me and says, come home, come home. Come home and join with me again. And that's what happened at the great exchange. My filthy rags were taken and... I literally felt like I was home. Finally, this little piece of dirty heart that was all so beaten and lost found a place in God's heart where it felt at home and it felt at peace and was not lost anymore. If you're feeling those things, if you're not quite sure where you are, if you're feeling abandoned, I want to tell you, you need to come to here. 
Because this is where you've been found, at the cross. When God the Father called his son to come to earth, to become just like you and me, to walk towards this place. He went through trials, and yet he did the Father's work. He sweated blood, and yet for the joy that was set before him, he walked to this place and willingly, willingly was beaten to a pulp and then bloodily hung on a piece of timber, nailed to it. The excruciating pain of that. We can't even imagine what he went through. If you just sit and ponder that in your private time and try to imagine the pain and the suffering that he went through, in every point as we are, he suffered. Every detail, every torment he went through, the crown of thorns is testimony to that as it was shoved on his head and jammed into his skull as the blood ran down. He was beaten beyond recognition. None of us have ever experienced anything like that. I've seen fights, I've seen injuries, horrific injuries. I used to pick up accident victims from cars for a short time working with the coroner. But nothing, nothing I've ever seen would ever compare to what he looked like. Nothing. And nothing can ever help you understand the weight of sin that came upon his heart, that came upon his mind, that torment. And yet he still had the power and the strength to joyfully go to this place for you and me. So there's the great cost that was born for us. And here we are today. We're celebrating Mother's Day today. And that truly is a, a wonderful thing to celebrate. Mums are very, very special. I, um, I often feel so inadequate that I can't give everything I can to mum now that she's lost dad. I can't replace him. I can be there for her. I can do as much as I can. But I see the loneliness in her. I see the pain in her and the wonder of what she's going to do. And we're trying to encourage her into a, a fullness. She can still live a full life and do things and and encourage others because she has a beautiful smile. She just embraces people. She loves people and people love her. She's infectious. That's a small act of love. You see, our love is, is unless we're living here and abiding in the word and living that word, our love is that, what do they call it, filio, love? It's our love. It's not agape love. See, the strength of agape love lays its life down. The strength of agape love took him, took Jesus to the cross. The strength of agape love put a joy in his heart for what he had to do, no matter what. He loved his enemies. He said, do good to them. As, you know, how, can, how many of us would do that? If you found a guy stealing your car, I read this the other day, Evelyn and I were reading this account. And he, this guy said, well, I'll just, I'll go and polish it for him. I'll go and fill it up. I'll clean it. I so here, take the car. And his analogy was, I don't want Satan to rob me. So therefore, I'm just going to give it to the guy. But that turn in our thinking you think, is that love? Yeah, it is. It's agape love. Agape love will do anything to win the soul. Will do anything to help the lost. And I'm not saying that because I do that. I don't. I question my heart every day. I want agape love. I try my best to live here, but I often move away, like you do. I'm not an orphan, I'm some, but I'm using me as an analogy. When God sit, wakes me in the morning and says, and the power of God is, is, was present to heal them all. He was actually in the presence of Pharisees and Sadducees when he said that. That's where he was. 
It wasn't with people that he loved, that loved him. He loved them, but they didn't love him. How often are we in that same situation where we're with people that we don't like and we know they don't love us, they want, us, want a piece of our flesh and yet we're not willing to go that extra mile for them. We can fight for a good cause and that's great because there's plenty of causes to fight for in this world. Unborn children, mothers being beaten by husbands, Husbands being beaten by their their wives. We forget that. It's not a one-way street. There are women out there who are just as bad as the men. And they abuse their children. But how many of us are willing to lay down our lives and go and step into that place of hatred, knowing that they hate you, and give all to them? I'm... This tears at me inside because I want to do this. And yet the thing I want to do, I don't do, as Paul said. And the thing I should do, I just don't do it. And yet God has given us all things pertaining to life. I came to the cross. I exchanged my filthy rags for his. And then he filled me with his Holy Spirit. And I began to babble in this silly little nonsense tongue. I used to make out I had different languages when I was a kid. I don't know what it sounded like now, but I used to make out I was speaking American and Italian and Chinese. This is sort of, I'm playing in the dirt with my cars and I'd be going over to Fred's ranch, you know, and this guy's Chinese. I'd go over to Ming Ding's with Balm. This is the silly things I used to do as a kid. But he baptised me in the Holy Spirit. And this is what God is saying. That gift, and I know we major on this, but that gift has everything in it pertaining to life. It will take us into everything. It will take us from our selfishness into giving. It will take us from our, from our fear into strength and courage. It takes us from not wanting to do anything to, doing, to wanting to do something because it can't help but fail. Agape love is let out as you pray in the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what it is. Because the whole journey, if you look in Corinthians, when it starts talking about the gifts, 11, 12, 13, right smack in the middle, Paul digresses back to, but I'll show you the most excellent way. Faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Because that's the whole journey. Because God is love. And we want to be like him. We're made in his image. So to be like him, we have to be agape love. And it's not impossible. It just depends on how dedicated we are, how we set our heart each day. Now, I majored pretty heavily on praying in tongues when I got the gift. I did it day and night. I would wake up in the middle of the night and I'm singing in tongues and praying in tongues. It just didn't seem to stop. I couldn't turn it off for some reason. But I set my heart to do it for some reason. It it gripped my heart. It was doing something inside here. It um, I had an encounter recently and I only, it only just dawned on me in the last couple of days what transpired in this encounter with my young brother. Now, my young brother's very, been very tormented all his life. And when he was living in Queensland, he would ring me often, um, yeah, pretty much every week, sometimes twice a week. And he talked to me. Now, at times he was living under a bridge because he had no money. And I didn't know what to do. I'd, I'd send him money from time to time. Um, he was trying to get work and I was praying for him. 
And so I love, I love my little brother, you know. I loved all my brothers. And he's so tormented that as he grew up, he became more and more angry. He shut down. And his way of protecting himself from the world is growl and fight. And he was a pretty mean character. No one wanted to go near him. A bit like the guy in Genesera in the caves with the chains, but not quite as man. But it, he just wasn't who he was meant to be. He was very angry. And it's still there. And the day my dad died, and um, I've t- told this testimony before, I was out here the day, of his fun- the day before his funeral, and I'm cutting the grass for dad, thinking I'm doing a good thing, because that's how he taught me to cut the lawns. And the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, your dad's not interested in that. And I'm thinking, it blew me away that he was talking to me in the middle of a lawn mowing thing. He can talk to you any time. I'm thinking, what do you think? Of course he he loves it. He taught me how to do the crisscross and the lawn. He loves that stuff. (laughs) But at that very moment, it dawned on me that he's in heaven with the Lord. And my dad was a Christadelphian. He didn't openly profess that Jesus was his Lord, but he read this word three or four times a day for 60-odd years. So those seeds that all went into him had to do something for him. He believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and so he was saved. So at that moment I knew he was in heaven with the Lord. He said he's not interested in the lawn. What he's interested in is the condition of your heart and the grievance you have between your two younger brothers. Now I'm fairly close to the youngest brother um, but I know I'm very close to him so I had a little bit of a beef with him So I thought, that's easy, I'll just settle that one. So I grabbed him on the morning of the funeral and I just gave him a big hug. We both cried and everything was good again. But my younger brother, he'd been manifesting towards me for years. So much so as a Christian, I don't know whether you've come across this, but as a Christian, the light of Christ in you shines and the enemy hates it. So those who are oppressed of the devil, they will hate you because they're not in charge of themselves. They're not in their right minds. And this was happening with my younger brother all the time. He would um, manifest around me and get angry towards me for no reason whatsoever. I could just say hi to him and he'd just go off at me. So this happened many times and many times I had that confrontation with him because he'd be picking on another one of my brothers who would go and shoot cancer. And he'd wanted me to go and beat him to a pulp. And I said, Pete, that's not who I am. You know that. Uh, I'm not one to go and pick a fight. Um, but I'll go and talk to him. But uh, the Lord had to pull me out of that place because he says, as he's throwing vile things at me verbally, I'm getting steamed inside. And uh, so I, I took a step towards him. And as I did, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, get out of here now, turn and get out of here before you do something you regret. So I turned and I left. This happened a few times. And the last time, there's a point to this, because remember I said I had an understanding of what transpired. My little brother came to the house last year, just over a year ago. You're sitting there and I'm always a little bit on eggshells when he's there because I never know which way it's going to go. Well, I I usually do, but he's talking away and then he said something silly and I said, stop it. He was slandering someone, my dad, I'm not sure. I can't remember the conversation now, but it doesn't matter. I just said, stop it, that's enough. And he got up and he started, he just manifested and he walked over and the kettle had just boiled and he was going to make a cup of tea. And I said, no, you're going to stop it or get out. And uh, he's swearing, swearing profanity. He's got a boiling kettle full of water up in his hand. And I thought to myself, you know, I've had enough. Video Love was talking to me. I've had enough. You can be patient with someone for a long time. You can show a great deal of patience in your own strength. But sooner or later, you're going to come to the end of yourself and you're going to snap. 
and tell them to bugger off. Well, that's what happened, was happening to me. I thought, I can't take this anymore. I'm sick of this. I love him, but he's just treating me like dirt. So this time I thought, I'm only going to hit him once. That's all, that's all it takes. I'll hit him once and he'll know that I'm in business. So he comes over Manasseh and I walk towards him. He wasn't expecting that because usually I turn and said, come on, out of here, try and calm it down. But I didn't. I deliberately went to escalate it. My love, not God's love. And as he come towards me, I, I lunged at him and I grabbed him. Now I'm in a pair of socks on the tiled floor. And as I lunged towards him, he, the whites of his eyes stood out because he'd never seen me do that. But he provoked me beyond my limit. And I wasn't inviting in God at the time. And he swung the kettle at me, hit me in the head, and the boiling water went everywhere. i got to tell you, I didn't feel it. He hit me three times in the jaw while I was holding on. I was swinging him around. All I wanted to do, because I was now, now skating all over the tiled floor on a pair of socks. And I was just going to get him over to a mat, which, which was only about six feet away. So I just kept shoving him and slipping and shoving him and slipping him until I almost got him to the mat. And I was going to give him one almighty heave and get him onto that mat. And then I was going to hit him once and knock him out because I knew it could. And you got to remember, this is not me. I, I don't do this. I never have. But I'd come to the end of myself. And I gave him one almighty... Oh, his clothes are ripped to shreds because I'm pulling him. I'm ripping his clothes. And I gave him one almighty heave. And as I did, my legs went whoop, like this. And I ripped the three hamstrings and the groin muscle off my leg, left leg off the bone. And I screamed in agony. <laughs> Get this. At that very instant, I was so grateful to God that he stopped me. He stepped in with his agape love for me so that I didn't hurt my little brother because that's not who I am. But that's what agape love does. It will step in to a violent situation I gave thanks to God for what had happened to me. It's changed my walk. Uh, it, it, it affects my back. It affects everything because I can't walk properly with all the muscles torn off. And I go to physio every, every week for some help. But a gak pay love will do anything for anyone. And all I know is as I give myself to the Lord, as I pray in the Holy Ghost and build my faith up, I will abide more. So if you're like me, you're sort of in and out. You read some, I read every day. But I don't abide every day. I don't stay a while as long as I should in this and meditate as much as I should because the Lord's told me to because he wants to take me from where I am to where he is. He literally has given us everything through what he's done. And he's equipped us with the things that we need to accomplish our transformation. You see, Jesus went up on the mountain and he was transfigured and the, the boys there were going, to, let's build a temple to him and all that. And then he come down and he cast out the, the, the epileptic spirit out of that boy because his disciples couldn't. And he sort of told them off, said, you bunheads, you know, how long have I got to put up with you? But you've got to remember, they've seen so many miracles and they just come back from doing miracles. He sent them out. He breathed on them, the anointing. And they put that anointing to work and they went out and did the work. See, I believe, I personally believe the transfiguration was God 
clothing Christ again momentarily with his heavenly body to give him strength. That's what I personally believe. He transfigured him because all of a sudden he shone as bright as the sun. He changed in an instant. And that's going to happen to us at some point. When Christ comes again, we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye from this earthly tent to a heavenly tent, a heavenly tent. The one that's been made for the glory. See, I can't get, I cannot get away from this. You've been given the gift of tongues. If you haven't, you need to be baptised in, in the Holy Spirit. If you're serious about your faith, then that gift of tongue is going to take you through the cross. It's going to give you wisdom. It's going to give you understanding. It's going to allow prophetic words to come from you because all the gifts are in order in, within, the, within the word and you can move through every one of those gifts. But unless you give yourself to praying in the Holy Ghost... Every Smith Wigglesworth, um, Robeson, what's his first name? Dave, Dave Robeson. I love what he's written in there. I, I keep reading it and I have to go back to it because there's the equipping. The revelation of God came to him to teach us how to go about doing the things of Christ. It's through that gift of tongues. And if you're not prepared to pray in it, then next year you're going to be right where you are right now and the year after that. You are not going to move. You're going to stay exactly where you are and yet you've got everything pertaining to life. It's a silly gift. But unless you use that gift, you're not going to move. You're not going to break any unbelief. You're just going to have a ceiling over your head day in and day out. You'll get little glimpses and then you'll go out of it. I'm being honest because that's what happens to me. Now, if it happens to me, I, know I don't see everyone, I don't know you all here. You should know people by their fruit. I always look at the fruit in someone's life, whether they're progressing. And uh, that gives you a good indication of where they are in Christ. but we've been given everything to move from our love into agape love. There's the exchange. You're rubbish for his goodness. He just requires us to set ourselves apart, to set our hearts every day, to consecrate ourselves to place the word within us so we've got some content in us that he, the Holy Spirit can reach in and take out. He's given us an anointing to do all things. I've just been held up a sign. Thank you, dear. She wants me to finish the story about my little brother. At that point, I was, as I said, I was grateful for what had happened to me and I've suffered for it ever since. Now, that was pre my dad passing away. And so he was the one I had to reconcile with most at the, at the funeral. So I approached him outside after the service because I couldn't get to him before that. And I said, look, can we, can we mend the fence, mate? You know, Because I'm your brother. I love you. I've always loved you. I don't want this nonsense going on. Yeah, 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 he goes. And he walks off. That was it. That's all I could get out of him. Oh, so I thought, didn't get far with that. So again, at the graveside when we committed Dad, he was walking off back to the car. So I made a beeline for him and intercepted him. And I called his name. I said, Wayne, he didn't stop until I virtually stood in front of him. Said, yeah, what do you want? I said, I wanted to tell you, mate, I love you. I really do. I'm your brother. I love you. I've always loved you. And I want to do what I can to, fit, you know, to make sure we've got a good relationship. 
So we just lost our dad. Surely we can. He wants this. I told him he wants this. And at that moment, I saw something like scales fall from his eyes. That's all I can describe. Something fell from him and I saw a softening in his heart. And that was it. No great um, bells or whistles. And then recently, my mum wanted to see him and he doesn't answer mum very much. Yes. But I took her across to him at Victor and he was home and I'd taken him some things from dad and I'd given, gave them to him and he was as happy as Larry. I'm going, what's going on with him? This is good. I didn't feel on edge. He was just like he had peace and he was happy. And we're talking away and he said, oh, some bloke gave me that black tarpaulin there. Do you want it? And I'm thinking, why don't you want it? It's a big tarpaulin. He said, no, nah, I'm not going to use it. You have it. So he gave it to me. I came over and put it in the container. I was grateful. But something, um, we, we bought a, a double garage for our our block over on Highmash Island and because we don't have the titles yet, I had to have it delivered here. So it's sitting over there by my ship's container. And I'm thinking, how are we going to keep it, cover this from the weather? And then it dawned on me. I got a brand new black tarpaulin that my little brother gave me. Now, I know it doesn't seem like a huge testimony to you, but something agape love lit up my heart at that moment because God had mended a fence that had been 25, 30 odd years old. From a boy, young man that I love, and I do love him, that would always manifest around me. Maybe you've got the same in your life. Maybe there's someone that's always cross with you for some reason. All I can say is use agape love. It never fails. I went a long way around to get to that place. But the only reason I've got there is because I try to pray in the Holy Ghost as much as I can. And I'm setting my heart again because I want to be in that place surrounded by people who don't like me. And God says, my power is here to heal them all. And then I can pray for them. I'll leave it there. We're going to have communion. I love this little communion book. It was given to me when I was going through throat cancer. A perfect stranger. Um, apparently I'd witnessed to her sister at a graveside while I was working at Centennial Park. I think sis. And uh, she told her sister about it. And for some reason, the Lord put on this woman's heart, this is for the man at the cemetery that his sister told you about. Go and give it to him. It's Health and Wholeness Through Holy Communion. It's by Joseph Prince. You know, Paul said that um, many of you have fallen asleep, are sick and have fallen asleep. And the reason he gives for that is because they had failed to discern the body of Jesus, the broken body of Jesus. Because this is implemented by God, a simple act that will bring health and healing either in your mind or in your body. It's an act that we can do as we remember. What, it's not the blood. Remember, it's not the blood. It's a discerning of the body, Paul said, that many of you have fallen asleep and have died. So as we take the emblems this morning, I ask you each one just to take your time with this small portion of bread. Jesus was the bread of life. And by partaking of this bread, by understanding and discerning what he's done through his body, when he took upon himself every sickness and every disease, when he was 
every torment, every piece of brokenness that mankind had, he took upon his body. So as we take this, this is what we're giving thanks for and we're eating to our own health. This small symbol of Christ's body can literally bring health to your mortal bodies, healing to your mind, to your emotions. Because the blood is, was poured out for you and me. It's the blood that covered our sins and made us whole. So as we eat of the bread and we take of the grape, which represents the blood of Jesus, know first and foremost that you are forgiven through the blood of Jesus. You're forgiven. Nothing that you've ever done or ever will do will ever separate you from the love of God. <laughs> Most importantly, eat this in remembrance of Jesus and what he's done for you. And eat to your health because that's what he wants. We thank you for this right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Take away my filthy rags. Well, Jesus has. I wish you once again a very happy Mother's Day if you're going to see your mum or whatever you do today, I pray you have a blessed day. I really do. If you've come to give, oh, there's a bucket to give. You're free to and you're free not to. It's between you and God. Bless you, everyone. Thank you.